We went to Ethiopia to look at this famine. It was the worst drought in 60 years they've seen in the Horn of Africa. And we went specifically to see the work the LDS Church is doing with some partners that they've been involved with in uh, disaster relief efforts around the world. Uh, specifically in some villages along the border of Somalia that have been impacted by the famine. And then also some refugee camps where uh, tens of thousands of people live who have fled uh, Somalia. My first impressions of the country, initially we landed in the capital. And the country of Ethiopia, by African standards, is, is, uh, has its act together. It's a fairly well-developed uh, country. When you get a little closer to the border, though, of Somalia, you see that it's, uh, it's one of the harshest places to live on Earth. Um, it's prone to famine. There are droughts every few years. The droughts have been, have been coming in successive waves. And since 1991, there essentially hasn't been a functioning government in Somalia. So there's a lot of civil war, and you have people who are under a tremendous amount of pressure uh, leaving the country. Some of the challenges in uh, reporting a story like this is that it's a very remote place. So to get out to one of these villages, it would take us two or three hours. And uh, I mean, it is about, you know, when you, when you talk about the middle of nowhere, this literally feels like that, in that uh, just huts, of basically sticks put together. There's no roads in terms of paved roads, no real stores, no electricity. So the elements are pretty harsh and uh, there isn't the sort of backup that you might be accustomed to. So the way I would describe kind of being there is uh, when you're in the city, you know, you can smell the, the sweat of the, the donkeys, you know, they, they pull the supplies on these donkey carts. You can smell the, they use these charcoal cooking stoves uh, to cook tea. Um, you know, there's open sewer lines, so it's, it's a rich smell. But when you're out in, uh, in these villages, um, it's a very primitive existence. Uh, and so it is, uh, you know, there's not a lot of sound out there. You know, you hear the wind and uh, that's pretty much it. Every once in a while a car will come by uh, that's hauling supplies to one of these refugee camps, but it's very remote and very primitive. Abdullahi Muse is, uh, is one of the in-country directors for a partner of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He works for a charity called International Relief and Development. And Abdullahi's task is to help villages along the border, 22 villages that have been impacted by the drought, and so what he directed was a project in which the villagers dug out these, what they call burkets, which are underground cement lined storage tanks that uh, catch rainwater. So this was an effort to help the villages become more self-sufficient. So when there's a drought in the future, they have some sort of way to get water other than having to hike, you know, a day's journey to a river to gather water. One of the neatest things I think that we saw there is that because of projects like this, people feel more self-reliant and they feel like there's, they have some control over uh, their situation because this is a devoutly religious people. You know, they don't think a lot about why there's drought to them. This is just something that God causes or he doesn't. And so it's easy to feel hopeless in a situation like that, but there's not much you can do other than hike for miles and miles to this river that is uh, so low that the water isn't good and causes you sickness or your children's sickness. Um, so one of the really neat things to see was how these projects help them feel like they do have some control over the situation, that they can make their lives better. And that's a really empowering feeling. When I hear about you know rain here in the United States, I think about how much we take for granted. Um, you know, water in much of the developing world is something that defines day-to-day -day existence. You get up in the morning and that's the first thing you're thinking about. When you go to bed at night, that's the first thing you're thinking about. Um, it's literally a life and death situation every day. Here, even after I came back, you know, you, you get in the shower and you, you want to make it just a little bit hotter. And uh, there's so much we have that we take for granted and we don't realize how in so much of the world, water literally defines existence. Amina is a girl that we met in a refugee camp called Melkadita. There's about 40,000 people who live in this camp. And her story for me was one that kind of spoke to hope in a really unlikely place. Amina is a girl who works for a charity that the church, the LDS Church partners with called International Medical Corps. 
and she works in the camp on a uh, project to reduce domestic violence uh, in the camp. She's what's called a gender-based violence coordinator. So she counsels with women, she counsels with their husbands, she's 22 years old, and uh, it's just, to me, her story is one that, that shows that even in a place like that, uh, where there isn't a lot of hope, she's someone who has found reason to look to the future. I think for now, refugee camps are possibly the only solution in terms of how many people are crossing over the border. At the height of the crisis, 2,000 people a day were crossing the border. Today, even though the drought was declared over in February, there are still 200 to 300 people who cross over every day. So it's really hard to imagine the scale of these camps, but they literally look like small cities. You'll see these white, they sort of look like covered wagon tents that just stretch into the horizon. Um, you know, one of these camps has 40,000 people in it, so it's really a city unto itself. And I think for now, that's the only way Ethiopia and Kenya can absorb this massive influx of people who have crossed the border. For me, one of the things I learned about the Mormon Church that I didn't know before is how involved they are around the world in disaster relief that I think a lot of even members of the church aren't aware of. In the last year, they participated in 111 disaster relief efforts in, I think, 50 countries. And uh, this was just one of those projects. Um, I think what was most impressive for me is that this isn't about proselytizing. There's no quid pro quo here. In fact, in the refugee camps, there aren't any missionaries. Um, this is work that's entirely being done by the locals. And the people that are there that are being benefited by these projects have no idea that the church is even involved. So to me, it truly is uh, an example of Christian service and that just trying to make a difference, trying to help people in, in a small way make their lives better. I think if there was one thing I could share with people who might be watching this, it would be that, number one, we take for granted so much that we have. And two, we can make a difference in other people's lives in small ways. I mean, there are dozens of charities that are involved in this effort. There are still 10 million people whose lives are literally at risk. There's something like 2.3 million children who are malnourished. Um, a small amount of money makes a huge difference, or volunteer hours. Um, and I think that when you see the scale of the suffering and how much we have here, any way that we can think to make a difference uh, is very important.